much um, for joining us. You just heard Las Violetas Mache. Uh, Las Violetas Mache, they are a youth uh, group in Honduras. They're politically active artists and they actually recorded some original music in our La Lucha Sigue film. And those songs that you just heard, we actually recorded in La Esperanza, the town where um, Berta Cáceres is from where Coquine is. And um, thank you so much for, for being here. So it's time now for everybody to come back and get settled back in. We're gonna start the discussion with Miriam and Berta, um, Miriam Miranda of Ofrané and Berta Zuniga Cáceres of Coquine. Um, just to let everybody know, you can write questions. If you have questions for them, please put your questions in the chat. And we will have um, a Q&A after their presentations. And there's also a Q&A button on Zoom. So if you wanted to direct your questions there as well, that's another place where you can put questions. So we're going to start by opening the panel discussion with Mary and Miranda. Uh, Miriam, te va a tocar hablar durante 15 minutos. And then we will hear from Berta Zuniga Cáceres afterwards. And so Miriam Miranda is one of the um, co-founders of Ofrené. Ofrené stands for the Fraternal Black Organization of Honduras. It's a leading and visionary voice representing the Garifuna communities on Honduras's north coast. Ofrené works to preserve Garifuna culture, indigenous autonomy, and traditional knowledge. Uh, quote, our liberation starts because we plant what we eat. This is food sovereignty, says Mary Miranda. Ofrené has galvanized a movement of Black, Indigenous, Griffina people to defend the resource-rich territories against land theft from multinational corporations, the state, and the oligarchy. And right now, we're going to hear from Miriam Miranda, who um, is one of the powerhouses in the world um, leading the struggle for land defense on the front lines in Honduras. She grew up politically, uh, organizationally with Berta Cáceres and Coquín and, and Ofrené have a very long intertwined history of solidarity. And they've been leading the, the struggle for justice in Honduras and uh, visioning a new Honduras. So Miriam has spent her life defending the culture, the environment, land rights of the Garifuna people. While studying in the university, Miriam began working with women in the economically marginalized neighborhoods on the outskirts of the capital city, Tegucigalpa. She listened to their stories, talked to them about their rights. Quote, that's where my fem feminist consciousness was born, Miriam explains. And in 1978, Ofrené was founded. Miriam has led Ofrené in key organizing battles to reclaim their land. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to, to Miriam to talk for 15 minutes. Eh, estamos invitándole a hablar, Miriam. Muchísimas gracias por estar acá. Go ahead, Miriam. 
Thank you for your struggle, your solidarity, which inspires so many people in the world and which is truly changing the world. And you deserve all my respect and the respect of everyone here. Go for it, Miriam. So first I'd like to say that, say thank you, Sam and Melissa, specifically Melissa, for being so patient. You've been so patient with us as an organization and specifically with myself. I want to tell you that to everyone who is here with us today to watch the documentary, I'd like to thank you and also people who have stayed after the documentary to listen and have this dialogue. I hope to take less than 15 minutes because I think it's important to have a space to have this conversation. I want to say first though that I'm in Vallecito and that's why I was a little nervous and Melissa was specifically nervous whether I was going to be able to connect or not. But fortunately, it's a miracle that my Wi-Fi is working. We often have a lot of internet connection problems and it is possible that the internet um, just cuts off in the middle of our conversation. But Carla Garcia, who is also connected and, and hopefully she'll also be able to participate. So I was watching the documentary and I was thinking, how messed up this country is. I was thinking and analyzing what to say, you know, what to say at a time when, when we have spent so much time with Berta, so much of my life with Berta. And I know other people, I, I have her in my heart, in my mind every day. And there are things that, that we're always remembering about what Berta is for us, for all of us. I want to tell you, I want to tell the world as we are you know, broadcasting this around the world, this moment right now, it's important to say that in Honduras, for defenders, people who defend human rights, we feel that Honduras is something that just invites us to to leave or accept our death sentence. And so along those lines, living here in Honduras and defending life, defending our resources, defending nature and the environment, defending humanity, the human beings, humanity. It's, it's kind of like thinking that we don't have any other options. We either become just observers or we take the decision in our lives to be responsible. Today in Honduras, human rights struggle must think about our responsibility as humans that we have a responsibility with the future generations because they ask and ask, why are you defending the water? Why are you defending the forest? Why do you have to sacrifice yourselves and face these daily attacks? Because at the women specifically, as women, we are responsible. And today, the women, we are giving birth to children but also to movements, to knowledge, to wisdom, because the women, we understand that this planet deserves a different kind of humanity because we are erasing our, our planet, we're wiping it out. And so along those lines, I can't not say that, that after the coup d'etat that turned Honduras into political laboratory and today we have a narco government 
and we have a situation where we we think about it we analyze how you know we're living on a different planet because honduras things happen that couldn't happen anywhere else and we realize that it's not just harder to continue our struggle but it's sometimes impossible and we are exhausted and we ask ourselves what are we doing what are we doing wrong what else do we need to do because we can't just talk and we can't just talk about others what the state isn't doing or the, what the companies are doing but today we must have greater knowledge and wisdom to confront the destruction this is destruction of humanity because in honduras we are facing tragedy after tragedy there's no way to build a country we're under a permanent emergency just two days ago we're talking about some of our colleagues and saying what how are we supposed to advance as honduran people when we can't even think we can't think of our path forward you know a midterm plan because we're constantly 24 hours a day responding to emergencies 24 hours a day we are being persecuted criminalized judicialized just days ago we had a major battle in trujillo to defend two sisters who had been detained they were arrested they were arrested by the police with a plan to disappear them they were accused of land grabbing but not just of that but also today they've constructed a system to apply justice and legislation not just to criminalize but also to use instruments to disappear them to disappear our struggle so today the indigenous peoples we are facing a, a new and not just the indigenous people but new kinds of crimes they are applying an article that was reformed to allegedly a, a, to apparently attack the martyrs but it's been used for forced disappearance there our people are being threatened with displacement to open the road for others they are perfecting the system to drown us they're perfecting the system not just to disappear us as the cases that we have seen in the last year last several year for the last two or three years we've had the worst crisis of our history not just due to multiple murders but because of this perfectly fine-tuned machine that has been built from a corrupt state and and marked in corruption and this is the true mafia that controls our country and this is what day by day we are facing and i think it's important to evaluate what's happening to have a discussion about what are the things that we can you know open and talk about because we can't just be responding responding to a state strategy to a mafia or political class that is not interested in the people and so i think along those lines it's important to continue constructing these ties and these solidarity networks but also we need to continue promoting autonomous process building autonomous process with true autonomy self action with community control and action that allows us to to stop or confront this avalanche, this war machine. Why are we being killed? It's important to have clarity in this issue. In Honduras, the humanitarian crisis that we've seen over the last decade, which led to the migration caravans, people are leaving as the only alternative that they have it, within this death plan, we have an unequal, fight and that's why from Vallecito we are constructing this model this process of resistance and a place that's under constant it's a constant fight for the control with criminal structures with organized criminal groups who want to use our land to traffic drugs 
And today, along the Atlantic coast, we are under major pressure against the communities, our lands, and our lives. And that's what we're facing day after day. It's important to understand that it's not easy to manage this. And that's why it's necessary, you know, with this documentary that we can, you know, share internationally what's happening. But it's also, I, I make this call that it's important and necessary to work from the different spaces where we can come together. It's not just the South that needs to struggle and fight. We're in a situation, this is a, a crisis that's not just an economic crisis or an environmental crisis or a social, this is a degradation that we experience day after day. And so let's analyze, let's look at our youth that's out there. What, who are the reference points? What are they being sold in the media? What is, as Sam mentioned, we are blessed because today we have the possibility to communicate through these international platforms. But how many millions of people are connecting to false ideas that they're being sold that have nothing to do with their reality? We have huge challenges because it's a question that we've been caught. We can see the environment as, you know, the environment is being destroyed, the resources are being destroyed, but they're also destroying our future generations, the possibility of thinking differently, of analyzing and questioning what's happening around us. We need to also analyze these aspects. And so we have been in the struggle for quite some time now, and we believe that we are losing some of these struggles in a very rapid way. These struggles of having this critical analysis and to reach the future generations because we know that there's a, a mental kidnapping and this mental kidnapping, we have to fight against it because it's, it's much bigger than us. It's much deeper than us. This is maybe you know, outside of the movie, but we need to look and see what's happening on the social media that's capturing our youth. And so I think, you know, what's, what's their future? What future do they have? I, I you know, think about my children and the young people I have around me. And there's a reality that we need to discuss and analyze. So I wanna conclude by saying, as, a, as Ofrené, we look to, to re-vindicate our land rights, our spirituality, our culture. One of our, our slogan, you for me and me for you. That's something that's so essential and has to do with the, the collectiveness, our common struggle, and that we have to you know, fight for these very small things that allows us to look at each other eye to eye as humans. This makes us human. Not you know, 24 hours or you know, captured or stuck within these machines that dehumanize us. And you know, those of you who are listening, you know, this is a daily struggle with our families, with our children. How can we fight against this monster? And the social media that have kidnapped our young people. And that it's also something that we have to work and fight against every day from Ofrene, from our organization. We know that one of the essential elements is working day by day to humanize our planet. If it's not a humanized planet, if we're not fighting for these small aspects that allow us to be humans and that allow us to laugh, to enjoy life, the wind, the things that give us life, we're not going to have a future we won't have a future. And so I think that that's what right now I can share with you all, colleagues, everyone who's connected today. 
sorry, I, I didn't talk about the documentary because you all already you know, saw the documentary. So I wanted to share some of the other ideas that I have in my head that I think are essential for the struggle, the struggle that doesn't look to have a solution, but we need to find options that allow us to fight against this monster. You know, as an example, we are fighting against the extractive industries, but in our homes, day by day, we have other dangers. The companies that sell us dirty water, water with sugar. The companies that sell us sugar water and they're destroying the planet with plastics. So our earth is being devoured by plastics. We're not going to be able to eat fish in 50 years because there won't be any fish left in the ocean. So let's, you know, talk about these issues about, you know, governments. Are we going to continue struggling for this pseudo democracies that are allegedly representative? Or are we going to construct governmental models with local power, with community power, with sovereignty, with autonomy that allows us to say and to act. Yeah, here, this will not happen anymore. You don't have to come and tell me what to do. We, we will tell you. Thank you. And we will continue in this conversation. Hugs to everyone. Thank you, Miriam. Gracias, Miriam. Um, thank you to Miriam for her words, for sharing the struggle of Orphanay, for sharing the struggle that they are leading throughout Honduras, and especially for your final words about the importance of self-determination and the respect that we all need to have for that. Um, I'm sure that folks have many questions and comments, and just a reminder that you can put those in the chat. Um, my name is Brigitte Ginther with School of the Americas Watch, and we are very honored to be hosting the film festival and this important discussion. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Bertha Zuniga Cáceres, who is the general coordinator of COPIN. And COPIN, as you have seen in the film, is a grassroots organization comprised of Lenca communities in Western Honduras, and it Copin has been pivotal in resuscitating the Lenca culture after hundreds of years of colonialism and violent attempts to force assimilation. And Copin advances and defends the rights of the Lenca people, as well as challenges capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. And Berta, who we are now going to hear from, is the current general coordinator of Copin and also was born into the struggle of the Lenca people as the daughter of Berta Cáceres. She grew up with her mom in protests and in Lenca communities and learned very early in life that speaking truth to power in Honduras is a dangerous act. Yet, like her mother, she refuses to be silenced and she is an inspiration to all of us. And so now we turn it over to, to Berta who will also have 15 minutes and then we'll have time for the questions. Entonces ahora damos la, la palabra a Berta. I just wanna make a quick announcement, uh, solo voy a hacer un anuncio uh, brevemente, just to remind people, if you need translation, you can click the interpretation globe at the bottom of the screen. Si necesitas uh, traducción, hay un globo. If you need to interpretation, there's a globe at the bottom of your screen. You can click there to choose the language that you need. You'll see it says off or Spanish or uh, off English or Spanish. And so if you need interpretation um, and you, you want to listen in English, you can select that channel or you can select Spanish. Bueno, eh, entonces se puede seleccionar o en inglés o en español. So you can choose either English or Spanish if you click on the globe icon and you will have access to the interpretation. So you'll have 15 minutes birthday for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. 
Good afternoon, all everyone. My very special greetings for Melissa, Sam, Miriam, Brigida, and everyone who is here with us this afternoon. So I'm also you know, thinking about what I can contribute. And we have understood that the aim of this festival has been to look at a construction of movements and the the struggles to defend water, as has been said many times, water is life for people. And so I just want to say that this is one of the struggles that Berta Cáceres carried out. And that's why the, why the work of all of our peoples is why the struggle for justice for her has had such a huge impact around the world. So I think that these efforts that we have through this um, film festival and the screening of this film helps strengthen the coordination that we must have between the communities to respond to these monsters, these economic and political interests that are present around the world and are acting. And that's why as people we've had to resist and to look for ways to do that. So I want to say that in the construction of movements, there are major challenges. I think this is something that we talked about with Miriam just a few weeks away. A few weeks ago, we feel that we are have challenges to find not just the capacity to coordinate, but also something that she mentioned into you know, so how it's not just having that coordination because we know it's important, but it's you know finding the ways, the values that can help you know, support us, the, you know, the mechanisms and the political goals for life. So I think this is something that we should continue working on and we see it in the documentary. I think it's also important to mention that the work is very important as well as all of the grassroots and communications efforts to, you know, break down the homogeny of the major communications outlets and to also talk about the struggles that exist in each community and knowing that you know among these major challenges such as those in Honduras and I think the U.S. people are, are, are aware of this due to the migrant caravans the lack of hope that we have seen and the fact that these struggles for land rights, which are, you know, are small, but among these circumstances. So for example, in the books that we've received from our colleagues in Mexico, they say, they say these are low intensity struggles because we are communities that are subjected to state violence. And so it's important that this message be shared with other people because we can join our efforts together in response to the challenges of community radios that are shown in the documentary and other efforts have made it possible in Copin and in other Honduran communities. It has allowed us to, to communicate our, our work. And so we know that we need to continue learning from these construction of movements and resistance among peoples and also for us the struggle for justice for my mother our colleague our comadre for the casas has been something that's essential because five years after her murder we continue there have been major efforts there's the Berta Castres law for human rights or the anti-corruption law in Honduras, we're currently in Senate of the United States, and they look to that you cannot say you're asking for justice for the peoples or that the violence stops if there is this economic support for 
the alleged security, but this is oppression of our people by means of our governments that violate human rights, that they are corrupt and have connections to drug trafficking. These are governments that have have opened the doors to the extractive industry to violate the people's rights. So along those lines, we believe that this, the goal of this documentary is to contribute to expand the hope, right? To intensify and expand the struggles in our country. I just want to say that we are very thankful that this documentary was made because it wasn't just any process. It was a process that was very participatory. And, you know, Miriam mentioned it was hard to sometimes coordinate with us. And, you know, we were able to watch it beforehand, share observations. We had a lot of you know, comments and we changed the timelines because it was a participatory process and it was very important. And that's why we feel so happy to have this documentary that really you know, shows to a certain extent an important part of our struggles. And so that's why I talked about not just doing things, but having a process that allows us to, that leads us on a, the, the best possible path. We didn't just want to walk down you know, any road. No, we want to have um, a process that includes our perspective. And I wanted to mention that as well. I also wanted to mention that that for us, something we have learned is that the struggles in these processes, they need to be as comprehensive as possible. And they aren't just struggles to defend land. They are also struggles against all of the oppressions that exist, the violence against women, where at the same time where we are you know, fighting for justice, we continue in the territorial struggle, which is maybe one of our most important struggles. You're having where we see that, you know, corrupt institutions and the extractive companies, we can't allow them to win this battle. Our land as a people's, and we must continue to defend it. And that's why we say it's been key to have solidarity because confronting the violence and confronting the constant threats, the fear that our lives will be taken away. It's something we've clearly felt in Rio Blanco. And, and it has been, it's been watched by the world, Honduras. We've told the world that the government has violated our rights. There have been you know, letters and actions from different peoples around the world to, to support our struggle. And so we want to reiterate that we have clarity that this is not just receiving solidarity. You know, even though logically we are victims of many violences, we always reiterate that we don't like to be called victims because it, we feel like we are marginalized by that term. And so we also want to share our solidarity that allows us to be a source in a certain way, uh, you know, hand in hand, accompanying other processes and other peoples and to show that the struggles are very similar in different countries and places around the world. So I just, that's, we're always trying to, you know, support through our our critical analysis from the struggle of our people. We know that we have a long path forward. It's not easy to think about how we can survive and at the same time seeing this huge journey before us to strengthen resistance um, with all the people. 
and to generate the best possible conditions in a country that is on a level of a crisis level, maybe the worst point that we've seen in the last 15 years. So I just want to say that we are sure that this we are on the correct path forward. And then when we can't do things nationally, we look for, you know, we try to carry out our dreams locally, but we don't forget about these goals that are much larger and our international struggles. And only with these, uh, the solidarity between everyone will we as a uh, hundred people be able to move forward. And so I think I'll end there and I think there'll be a question space and so I'll close there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Berta Miriam. It's wonderful to see your faces. And I send you huge hugs from the distance in Vallecito and also in Esperanza. So now we are going to, in the question and answers section of this film festival, continue putting your questions in the chat. So I'm going to ask you two or three questions to Berta Miriam. You can answer whatever you prefer to answer. And then Melissa will ask a couple more questions. So I'm going to start with a question from, from Miriam, from Elisa Santos. She is asking Miriam if you could talk more about the university project for ancestral knowledge, how how these traditional knowledge supported the communities um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the situation uh, today. Thank you for that question. I think it is an important question because precisely we have been talking about the, you know, the defense of territory and also the defending our ancestral knowledge. And so Ofrene, on March 17th of last year, we knew there wasn't just a collapse of the healthcare system on a national and, and international level that we weren't prepared for a pandemic. Knowing what this, what the Honduran healthcare system meant, it now wasn't just, you know, pillaged, but also sold, we decided to promote our COVID healthcare tension posts from our ancestral knowledge, our traditional ancestral knowledge. And so we're able to establish 33 centers in different communities to respond to COVID. Today, 22 are still operating. But this has been an opportunity, uh, maybe sole opportunity to create what are these centers to safeguard ancestral medicinal practices in a very specific and concrete way in the context of COVID. We were the first people to start making masks and, you know, women, it's always the women, the women's groups were created to do this. And the objective was to avoid to the extent that was possible that people would go to the hospital because we knew a year ago, imagine that it's you know March 20th today. We knew that the people that if they had to go to the hospital that they would die. And this has been shown, it's been proven over time. The majority of people who have been cured, and for, fortunately, we have a very low level of people who were um, infected with COVID, but we knew it was so important to strengthen our immunological system, and that was our mission. And that's why today, in all of our Garufina communities, and these continue to operate, we're um, sharing teas to strengthen the immunological system, but we've been doing all sorts of different things, you know, gels, face masks, you know, doing house visits to raise awareness. And that's the ancestral knowledge. You know, it's our, our old people, our, our grandparents, 
you know, they, they cure themselves from a cold with tea. They didn't take a pill, but with a healthcare system that has become a business, the first thing they do is say, no, you have to buy these pills or you have to go to that doctor. So, you know, when a hundred or 200 years ago, people didn't even know what a doctor was, much less a hospital or a clinic. And, and maybe there were less deaths, less people died and something's happening there. And so I think, and, and I'll close there. Thank you for your question. I think this is opportunity. And so thank you for this question because we have been talking about this in different spaces. COVID, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, which is one of many pandemics that will come, it forces us to think about, you know, really discussing what is health. Health isn't just going to a hospital and that, you know, you see a doctor health is that around you there is clear clean air that the mountains aren't destroyed that there is healthy food there's what you know because many of you who are here you know it, that health is hand in hand with healthy food with not having you know being exposed to toxic toxics and many other things and that's why you're fighting for our territories it's also fighting for our health but fighting for our health is fighting for our territories and so i think we have a, a, a very unique opportunity and so we are creating two ancestral garifuno health centers to work on There is no sound. We have lost Miriam. You're, you're muted right now, Sam. I think Miriam has maybe lost her signal. Bueno. So while we wait for Miriam, Carla, do you want to add anything? Good afternoon. I'm the, we're the, the uh, plan B in case something were to happen to Vallecito. Uh, my name is Carla Garcia. I'm one of the coordinators in Nofrena and I live in New York. And so I'm also carrying out work for the Garifuna community in relation to the question. I think the last thing that Miriam was probably going to say, our sister Miriam, is that COVID itself and the pandemic have been useful to teach other women how to help their community in relation to health. This has become a university that doesn't have a building yet. It doesn't have walls and a roof, but we have our ancestral doctors who are currently in a, in a process of learning many new things that are useful, not just to improve the immunological system, but also to maintain their physical health through spiritual practices and with knowledge of plants and other medicines in our environment that are close to us. I'll close there. Thank you, Carla, for adding that. Okay, so now we're going to Go to Berta. We have another question for her. I, th I think it's also Larisa. Larisa is asking Berta in the in the movie you mentioned the U.S. imperialism in relation to the oppression of the resistance. Can you talk about the relationship between military Honduran military extractive industries and the war industry? Bert, are you with us? Here I am, I'm here. Okay, so that is a, a complex question, but I think maybe to simplify this in relation to what we, this documentary and in other spaces, I think it you know shows this relationship I think it's important to say that the extractive model has been promoted in large part after the coup d'etat, and it's something we always reiterate, 
And so this coup d'etat had the support of the international community, specifically the global north, which has the power to validate or not when it is when it's a dictatorship or when there's not a dictatorship, when people are allowed to stay in power, even though it's been taken with weapons, if that is, you know, if it's along the lines of their interests. And so I think it's important to say that Ofrene and Copin denounced after the coup d'etat that the concessions granted by National Congress were in a violation of the principles of prior consultation for indigenous peoples in Honduras. So where we saw that there was an illegal um, action, and as we have mentioned, a large part of the communities, they realized that these projects existed when the machines or when they were already carrying out the studies, not prior to them. When the machines arrived and there was not, had they had not given their consent or their permission, they weren't, they didn't agree with these development projects. So in Rio Blanco, when the protest started, we said the response was is sending the police and the military to uh, repress the people to violate their rights and to force them to accept the projects. But we also saw there was active participation in persecution and attacks and, and, and the crimes that took place, such as it, Doma Garcia was a military officer who murdered that person, it's something we always remember. It was a very difficult process for Copin and the, the ruling against that military person. My, my mom always said, I'm not sure if that's true, but my mom always said that he was the first convicted military person for the murder of an indigenous person. So also in when my mother was murdered, many people who participated had received military training and one was a, a part of the military. He was, had a high you know, ranking within the special forces, the police and the military in Honduras. And so this shows the participation that these actors have in the oppression and intimidation of our people. And so the United States, it provides the most important contribution to Honduras in relation to security. That's what they call it. And this is money for, for example, for the army to continue to grow as a force you know, there's, they don't have a war against any other armies, only against the people. And so, and the, you know, the logistics, all the equipment, and not just the tear gas, but all sorts of other uh, kinds of equipment that Honduras has received. Like these are tanks, these are tanks that that have a really loud noise that, that bothers your ears. I don't, I don't know what they're called. All this military technology to repress the people because Honduras doesn't have a war against anyone else. They don't have a, a territorial conflict with anyone else. It's a war against the Honduran people where drug trafficking has been an excuse. They say they're drug trafficking, they're fighting drug trafficking, but they're just they're using it against the people, the people that is defending their territories or protesting to recover democracy. So I think that's the situation. It's not necessary for the Lenka people. We see this in Guaylan and the and all over in all the you know peasant, small scale farmer, indigenous communities that are carrying out resistance. The first response from the government is always a militarization and violence against the people. Thank you so much, Berta. I have a question here for Carla. 
Bueno, quería invitar uh, a que hablas un, un poco And I'd más. like you to invite to talk a little bit more about the Garifunas uh, colleagues that were kidnapped, were kidnapped last year. Can you please talk a little bit about that context and what's happening in that case? Thank you, Melissa. And sorry, I hadn't say, said hello, hi, Sam, Bridget, Anne, everyone else. So the Garifuna community has seen a wave of violence against our people in the last few years. 2019 was horrific years for the Garifuna peoples because more than 40 people, more, 40, more than 40 community members were killed in 2019. These are people who were you know, fighting for the territory in different areas. I think Miriam talks in the documentary about some people were killed in less than 72 hours. At that time, we had um, very difficult days. 2020 did not see an improvement. As you know, there are two cases. There were already convictions from the Inter-American Human Rights Commission in favor of the Garifuna communities, one in Punta Piedra and one in Triunfo de la Cruz. These are favorable convictions where the kidnapped you people are from Triunfo de la Cruz. So to give you a little bit of context there, so one month before the young people were kidnapped in Triunfo de la Cruz, they were kidnapped and people appeared a few days later murdered. Some other people from Punta Piedra. We're talking about two communities that have won a favorable ruling in the inter-American system. So this person was one of the main witnesses so that the court would rule in favor of Punta Piedra and against the state. And then there was a kidnapping of this individual. We call this a forced disappearance against four young people in Triunfo de la Cruz. Albert Senado was persecuted because he was promoting or pressuring for a fulfillment of the ruling. So we know that the ruling was issued five years ago, but today it still has not, they have not even started, the state has not even started to fulfill that ruling. There hasn't been any sort of investigations of any of the crimes that I have mentioned, not from 2019 or 2020 or 2021, because we do already have um, some additional crimes this year. And the Garifuna through OFRENE has decided to create an interdisciplinary investi criminal investigation team. Many organizations, human rights organizations, international lawyers, um, our own community and national lawyers and, and people in the country have said, yes, yes, we will join this committee because to date, regardless of whether the Committee on Disappeared People in the UN and the Inter-American Human Rights Court, the OAS, has asked for a response from Honduras in relation to the investigations, the investigation of this forced disappearances nothing specifically concretely has shown that the state is investigating these disappearances. And so we have created this committee and we're starting a process where we are collecting testimonies because, because our aim is to access the truth. SUMLA, the committee was initially designed as designed to, to specifically address these forced disappearance of these colleagues, but all the Garifuna communities are asking themselves if Sola would also help them to investigate murders and disappearances that have taken place in previous years in our communities. So currently we have, we are carrying out a investigation process to learn the truth, not just for the Garifuna communities, but in Honduras and in the world. And we hope to have the support of all of you through this process. Thank you, Carla. I'm seeing the chat that there was another question from Brian Peck. He was asking about news about um, the colleagues that were disappeared. So thank you so much. 
Bertha, I have another question for you. I'm actually going to I'm going to ask you two questions and, and you can kind of respond to based on what you feel is most appropriate or respond or share whatever you feel is most important. Melissa asks if you can share, Bertha, a little bit more about the, the decision making process within coping and the organization mobilization um, efforts and tell us more about you know what happens at the Uto utopia center and we'd love to hear more about this the second question is from in just one second the second question is is from our colleague Chung Wahan and says Bertha can you talk more about how you and Copin and the other women are building a feminist a global feminist network through the Bertha Cáceres School the the feminist school. Can you talk more about that, please? Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry, my dog is in the background barking. I hope you can hear me. Sorry. So in relation to the organizational process with COMPIN and decision making, I think it's important to say that COPIN is, is a, you know, different communities that through the concept of the indigenous councils, they come together in this space. So generally, there are a lot of communities who have uh, come to Copin and to share their concerns on specific issues, you know, land rights, education, extractive projects, or even, you know, economic needs of the communities. And so based on that, the communities come together in what is called the, the Coping General Assembly, which is where we make the most important decisions. So it's important to say that I think all the indigenous communities, the main decision-making process has to do with you know the assemblies, the local assemblies and the regional assemblies, and then the assemblies that bring together all of the communities, which is essentially coping. So that's um, kind of the, the structure. So along those lines, we have always um, you know, highlighted the importance of participation of all the diversities within the communities specifically. And we've given a very important role to our elders, uh, the youth and women. This has also been a process. Um, this has been an internal struggle within our organization to you know, break down the historic silence where many women have been, have been you know, subjected to colonial and patriarchal and structures and other oppressions. So I think this, everything is decided um, with, through the assembly process. And then there's also kind of operational groups who have the role of you know, implementing the decisions, these dreams and these projects. So Utopia is a gathering center that has the aim to implement the life project to be an autonomous space for meetings and assemblies as there, you know, there are other spaces as well, but we wanted to have, have a space to realize our the dreams of the Lenka people, such as you know the community networks, the organic production, our organic crops, and also different spiritual aspects. 
So utopia is kind of a space for our, our dreams and to help them become reality. And so last about the International Feminist School, Copin has had you know, contact with different organizations and movements. And we're thinking a lot about the contribution um, from you know, feminists in this emancipatory processes. And so we have been building a curriculum um, with different grassroots organizations to be able to address and expand and learning processes on feminism to support our struggles. And so last year we are working to create a training process that will start this year. And this has been a slow process, but a continuous effort with different organizations. And so we're thankful for everyone's efforts. And so this school will, you know, very recently, we um, asked to use Berta Cáceres in the name, and we said that for us as Copin and as you know, daughters and a son, we felt honored that the school that had that looked to respect or to you know really share this knowledge, the knowledge that was part of her struggle, her grassroots struggle against systems of oppression, this territorial resistance, this internationalist struggle. So you know this process we felt that was very important and really reflected her honor and her memory. Muchas gracias, Berta y Carla, para contestar. Thank you, Berta, Carla. Thank you for responding. Now we're going to open up a space for Anne and Melissa to close this first block of the day. We're going to later have another um, short that talks about the it's a within struggle in Canada. You shouldn't miss that um, this afternoon. But first, Anne and Melissa. So I was thinking that before we close this space with Anne. Maybe there's some other words that Carla and Berta, if you would like to add anything else, if, I don't know any ideas or closing words. There are a lot of people, you know, also asking, you're saying I do this and that, but I don't feel like it's not enough. So how can I support your struggle even more? I will open the space um, for both of you to answer or to you know, comment whatever you'd like to, um, to close this space right now. So thank you. I wasn't supposed to close, but in the name of Ofrene, I'd like to ask everyone who's watching us today and who might listen to us later, who is able to listen to the transmission, we need to do many things as a humanity. We have forgotten the value of silence. We have forgotten that we need to be ourselves to help others. I could initially ask you all, to each of you, doesn't matter where you are, that you plant a tree and you will say, ah, I live in a city and it's full of cement and it snows all the time and I, I can't plant a tree. And I would say, yes, you can plant a tree. Close your eyes for half an hour before you go to bed and imagine yourself planting that tree. And each day for half an hour, you can watch that tree grow and every leaf of that tree. You can visualize your love for nature, your love for yourselves and your love for, for others. When this tree has a 
thicker trunk right on the trunk your aims for the indigenous communities for the black communities each time that the copines protect a tree they are protecting air for the earth every time the garifuna community defends a beach they are making it possible for all of us to have access to fish remember oceans are vital for the whole world's life i'd like to say that we can go beyond these material aspects so obviously they are necessary we can't deny that we are people who economically we don't have the capacity that other communities might have but here we are one of our sisters in lenka said she said some beautiful words if you come to look for me you'll they'll find me i'm not afraid and so that's the next thing i'd like to ask you that you can help us always to continue our struggles we have not been beaten down by fear we will continue forward but we ask for the world to accompany us one of the dreams of our sister bertha who i admire so profoundly was that there would be integration what are we looking at as the indigenous and black communities of Honduras? that we don't have to fight anymore we are fighting to not have to fight and the only way that we can do that is through these thoughts of integration that Ofrene and Copin have, but not just integration between communities. We're talking about an integration that is global. We're in a world that is beginning to truly manage our lives, not just through technology, but also through fear, militarization, the use of weapons. I poisoned foods and not just the children of the Garifuna Olenka people will disappear. The children of the entire world will be disappeared. And that's why this dream of integration. And, and so I just like to repeat the words of our sister, Ritha. there's no more time. Now is the time to wake up now. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Carla, for your words. I would just like to say that all of the efforts have an impact on our struggle. And sometimes we don't see it right away, but all of these efforts have been important it, to sustain, you know, for five years, the fight for justice is because it hasn't been forgotten. The memory of Bertha Cassis has not been forgotten in a country country where so many people are killed. There's ongoing scandal, but then oftentimes everything is, is forgotten. The names and memory are often forgotten, and that's the, maybe the saddest part of the situation. So I think, you know, each of you from where you are, from your specific actions and efforts, you can contribute different things. But I think it's important to remember what Carla mentioned is that we need to do it in the most collective way. And so the call of this festival is to build movements to strengthen the struggles, to clarify you know, our political focus to renew our goals, to expand our vision and our commitments. And so I believe that this is something that's extremely important. And I don't think we can say that, that you know, the battle has not been won. We need to have strength and, and continue forward and to remember that we are on the right path and that we need to continue walking forward with joy. And you know, the struggle is difficult and complex, and sometimes it eats away at our vitality. And so I think it's very important. And each person has 
you know, something to give to this journey to defend life. Muchísimas gracias, Carla. You're a thank you so much, Carla, Berta. Thank you for your efforts and your struggle and your words. It's difficult to be in your regions with the Garifuna and the Lenca, with the Wet'suwet'en peoples and, and, and so many other people in St. James in with Anne and Shireen. It's difficult to be in these communities and, and not leave as a different person. It's impossible, quite honestly. It's impossible not to be changed. And so thank you for your struggle. A goal that we have for this festival is to coordinate between the struggles, to bring them together, to do more in collective because we are stronger together and to reflect about these connections, the connections between the indigenous black struggles to protect the land, the environment, the air that is obviously tied to the militarization of the Honduran people and financing from the United States, weapons from the United States. It's important to have these reflections to see all of these connections and why all these struggles are interconnecting. Why are youth and children fleeing? And here in this country, we hear just last Friday news on Democracy Now! And I talked about that there are 14,000 14, children, 14,000 children from Latin America who are being held in detention centers under our government. And so we need to have a very deep seated reflection about the role that the United States, the government of the United States has in all of this that's happening. And at the same time, I think we need to support these struggles that clearly have a political vision. Yes, it's true. But more than a political vision, they you are constructing something else. It's You're not just talking about you know, what to do. It's you're looking at all of the challenges that exist in the world and you are constructing a, a, this new dream with a coconut university with all of these projects either carrying out in utopia this is a model it's a model for the world and so thank you so much from the depths of my heart thank you for sharing these important examples with us because sometimes it's easy to you know, be you know just washed away by the destruction and the death and so we need to reflect on how we can continue forward on this journey when the systems push us away and so i'm just so profoundly thankful for your inspiration for your time your energy your struggle regardless of how difficult it might be. And whenever I see the documentary, I've ever seen a thousand times the documentary, but I always hear when Marlene says that Berta always said, compa, life is beautiful. I don't want to die. So we need to, we need to continue that struggle. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now I'm gonna open up the space for Anne Whitehead, but I'm so thankful, I'm so thankful and warm hugs for all of you. Thank you. Hello everybody. Thank you so much, um, Sam and Melissa and all the speakers today. I'm just going to speak very quickly here and remind everybody to please visit our, um, our raffle page and our main fundraiser page. And I also just want to say thank you very much to everybody who's donated so far because we have gotten 
uh, well, we surpassed our goal for today, which is so awesome. So everybody give each other a, a round of applause. Thank you so much for donating. And um, so our goal was to reach at least 3000 and we're over just over $4,000 now. So thank you so much for that on the raffle on the raffle. And please continue to donate. We want to send as much money as we can to these groups. Okay, so we want to support the the healthcare clinics that they're developing down there but that Ofrane is developing for the in response to COVID-19 so please donate so we can send them more than two thousand dollars you know we need to help the communities do this kind of work and you can also donate on our main web page as well fundraiser page if you want to donate a larger donation um, and you don't want to do the raffle tickets any donation is welcome we have about 18 prizes on the uh, raffle page so far and other folks are also going to be donating so keep checking back that's it that's all i want to say i know everybody needs to go take a break thank you so much thank you so much for everybody and your presentations awesome thank you Anne. thank you once more carla and berta it's such magic being here and speaking with you and hearing we are now going to take a 15 minute bio break. Once again, just stretch those legs, um, get some water. You can see that right now the QR code for the raffle is being played. So like, um, I'm gonna play some music, but pop, feel free to pop out your phone, check that QR code. That will bring you right to where you need to go. Um, so I think Nancy's gonna read some saludos.